Good evening and welcome to this webinar brought to you by Clockwork Medical and sponsored by JRI Orthopaedics. I'm Kate Stoddard, Education Manager, and it's wonderful to have you join us this evening as we take a closer look at bone conserving cementless hip stems. Welcome everyone, whether you're in the UK or different time zones all around the world, thank you for joining us live. So, can a short femoral stem improve outcomes in hip arthroplasty? Well, shorter femoral stems have been shown to improve proximal fixation, osseointegration, and reduce stress shielding. But is it right for your practice and your patients? And how can you achieve best outcomes? We're joined by three highly respected orthopedic surgeons with extensive experience of using a short stem, with differing practices and different surgical approaches, who between them have accumulated over 2,500 implantations. So this 60 minute webinar will begin with a review of the benefits and survivorship of a short stem. Mr. Kerry Acton will tell us why a short stem suits his practice and how he achieves such fantastic results in over 1000 cases. And as a conservative stem lends itself to a minimally invasive approach, Mr. Johan Witt will deliver his rationale for a bikini approach. So I'll just do some housekeeping. If you could let us know your feedback after the webinar by completing the evaluation form sent to you by Clockwork, you will need to do this to receive your CPD certificate. Do ask lots of questions through the Q&A function on Zoom, and we will have a Q&A after each presentation. If you can't stay for the full hour, you can access the recording later on both the JRI website and on the Clockwork Medical website. Please follow us on social media. You can post your comments using the hashtags shown here. And I think most people are perhaps a bit over familiar with Zoom these days, though maybe not all. So I'll just point out some of the functions there. We will be asking you some questions at the start and at the end using the polling function. And you too can ask questions throughout using the Q&A. So to submit a question to the panelists, just select the icon at the bottom of your screen that's pointed out there. It does get a little tricky when questions are sent through the chat. So if you could try and stick to the Q&A, that would be perfect. A window will open for you to type your questions. And if it is for a particular presenter, if you can make that clear, and we'll do our best to um, answer as many as possible throughout. OK, we do like to begin our webinars with a poll of the attendees to find out a little about your practice. The first one is about to show up on your screens. If I could ask you to select one answer to the question, currently, what proportion of your hips are uncemented? So we have under 20%, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, and 80 to 100%. Okay, can we reveal those answers, David? Right, okay, so we've got 29% saying under 20% is uncemented, 12% in the 20 to 40% bracket, also 12% in the 40 to 60%, and 27%, 60 to 80, and 20% in the 80 to 100. So we have some significant users of uncemented hip stems there. Next question, what approach do you use for the majority of your total hips? Your options are posterior, anterior, lateral, superpath, or an other. Okay, David, do we have those answers in there? Right, okay, so as you might expect, 60% using the posterior approach. Um, next, most popular would be the lateral approach with 26%, anterior approach at 12%, and a small number, 2% doing superpath. Lovely. Final question before we move on. How likely are you to use a short hip stem in the near future? So, already using a short stem? Likely, not sure, or not likely? And if you could reveal those answers, right. Great, so 49% of the attendees this evening saying they're not sure. So that's fantastic, you're in the right place. 23% uh, already using a short stem, 26% likely and 3% not likely. Okay, so we might revisit that at the end. Okay, thank you very much for participating in that. So, Next, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Justin Cobb, renowned consultant orthopaedic surgeon, clinical lead and chair of orthopaedics at Imperial College London. So Justin, if you could tell us what are the benefits of short stems? Uh, thanks, Kate, and hello everyone. Um, it's very nice to be with you all. I wish we were meeting in person. Um, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time 
right now talking about um, short stems and their benefits. And during the course of the evening, I hope um, we'll persuade you all of their benefits. And um, first of all, um, my name is Justin Cole. I work at the MSK lab in Imperial College. We're a group of surgeons, engineers, and scientists. Do come and see us in our swanky new home in White City, which we moved into just before lockdown. Seems a long time ago now. There are five surgical domains in hip arthroplasty that I want to talk about, um, or at least discuss. A soft tissue management and approaches Johan's going to deal with um, in, in greater detail. Um, and arthroplasty technique, Kerry is going to bring that. They're going to talk about how to, how to use the instruments and how to get what you need out of them. Fixation in hip arthroplasty, well, it's obviously tremendous everywhere in the world, everywhere that is except for Sweden and small parts of the United Kingdom. Head size, bigger is clearly better as long as the head ceramic, but stem length is the thing we're going to talk about um, today. Now, Andy Murray is about the only person who was really too young for a, a furlong evolution. Um, too old, well, there's no such thing as too old. Here's a patient who got back to his sport of carriage driving quicker than Andy Murray got back to playing tennis. Um, his operation was now three years ago. Of course, Andy died of this year. But six weeks later, he was at his uh, grandson's wedding in, in, in Windsor. Um, and as this on tenter hooks for it, we would arrange for everything. Um, and here he is. Well, I wasn't expecting him to go out of the car this way, but here he is getting out of the car with his, his wife, who, of course, um, and here I think we have a talk about which hip it was and which approach it was. Perhaps we'll do that later on. Now, biomechanically, I think there's very good evidence now that shorter stems actually function better than longer stems. Um, to, to prove that, all you need is a keen CT1 and that Mesin talk test rig and two stems. The long stem, the furlong HACs, ODEP 13A star rated. The shorter one, ODEP just 7A star rated now. But if you put them into a, um, a rig and test them to failure with validated dry bones, and, and then you use a, a cadaveric model, and you see that the shorter stems, as you load them in that torque testing, they fail in a very predictable way, just the same way that the cadaveric bone fails. And the longer stem fails in a different way, with a somewhat more unpleasant fracture to fix. Um, but the cadaveric bone breaks in just that same way too. But the load it takes to break them is different. The, the furlong um, can't absorb um, as much energy as the, as the evolution stem. 12% more energy is absorbed before failing and with a shorter stem in a dry bone model, of course. If you look at the um, hysteresis loop of the stress strain model, as you, as you load up that femur, obviously this is well below fracture rate right here, you see that the control femur has this lovely flexibility. And with a shorter stem, you maintain more of that flexibility than the longer stem. And we think that that does explain why um, there's a bigger load to failure. And it might mean that they feel more normal. But does this actually make a difference? Um, I think it does. And if we're going to show that in, in, in clinical studies. We tried to show it initially by looking at um, a range of stems, the long stem furlong, the short stem Evo, the even shorter stem silent tip, and the BHR. And this was early in our experience. And with only seven of these silent tips, they were all in women, um, and they were pretty young. Um, much older were the evolution stems. And this is, um, no, this is beyond noise. This is a significant difference. They were older. Um, and this was early in our experience. You see, they've all got these same gait patterns of five kilometers an hour. Um, if you look at the, how they push off, we see that the, the pink, the, sorry, the pale blue, which are the Evos, are on the older end, up in the middle 80s. And of course, they're functioning a little bit differently. And weight acceptance um, doesn't seem to be a, bit, a, big, a big thing. But in the cadence, they were older, so they had a slightly higher cadence for any given speed. Um, and uh, when you look at the energy um, absorbed, the entire impulse, the non-operative side did work harder in the hip replacements and the resurfacings. Um, and that, that did seem to be a, a significant difference. 
However, that changed, or our understanding and appreciation of that changed. I mean, this paper that Anatole published about three years ago, when he just had 20 uh, long-stemmed, 20 short-stemmed, reasonably well-controlled, still older um, in the short-stem group, more female in the short-stem group, but very high Oxford head scores, 46 um, in, in both groups, uh, very, very well-functioning. And this is the data that um, he, he presented. Here they are going slowly. This is heel strike. This is push off on a treadmill. And this is that mid stance stress um, relieving phase. And this is the control group, left and right legs. They're identical. When we look at the difference between them and the regular furlongs and the short stems, we see the short stems, four, four and a half, five. It's only at five and a half kilometers. You can tell any difference at all. From, from from completely symmetric, and really they're pretty symmetric, but at all speeds, there is a difference between the normal leg and the operated leg, with a good leg working harder at all speeds with a longer stem, whereas that difference is only apparent um, at faster speeds with a shorter stem. Now, when we look at um, the um, uh, downhill, sorry, uphill walking now, 5%, 10%, 15%, we see that in the control group here, this is heel strike, this is push off. So you're pushing off a bit harder than your heel strike. And again, the symmetric, normal people, completely symmetric. Of course, they're pretty symmetric. These hips are very good and compared to knees, they're just excellent. But the, um, the short stems, even though they're putting all this much more energy through in their, in their um, push off, they're still really symmetric at 10%, still symmetric at 15%. But in the um, um, longer stems, the, the good leg is working harder, not much harder, but it is working harder throughout that range. So the shorter stems really are significantly better than the longer stems in, their, in, the, in functional terms in the gate lab. Does that convert into registry data? Well, I think it probably does. So here's the registry data. And this is brutal stuff. First, we did the very first case in December 2010, and this is an up-to-date data now from very recent download, 5,500 cases, and this includes the entire learning curve. We didn't have one pilot case before. Um, and what we're seeing, and the red line is the furlongs, and this is cumulative revision, all reasons for revision, excluding metal and all bearing types here. This is the learning curve here, but we're way better than, than all cementers and, and even now better than adjusted cementers. Here are the brutal numbers. 2.4% for all bearing types at eight years. All other cementer stems in the energy are 3.9. All total hips, 3.3. And the confidence levels there are 3.3 to 3.4. That's the confidence intervals. This is significantly different. So the furlong is safer and better um, for all covers, including all of our data. Now, if you look at patient survivorship, Hadi Alaga um, did this um, using the Swedish registry. Um, he shown uh, using machine learning that um, um, a really interesting study looking at all the patient variables, surgeon variables, cut variables, um, and looking at just at mortality, he's shown 30, 60, 90, and one day and one year mortality. In all of these, prosthesis group falls out. And in the univariates and the multivariates, cemented fixation is an independent predictor of mortality. So short stems, short cement less stems are functioning better and they're safer. Um, of course, we'll talk during the discussion about how you treat fractures, but shorter stems are definitely easier to fix than longer stems. And there's not enough time to talk about resurfacing. That's another story altogether. So I hope I persuaded you that short stems are function better biomechanically, function better in the gate lab, and do even better um, on the NJR. Thanks very much for your attention. Okay, well, I will say thank you to Justin there. Um, he is joining us later, but unfortunately he's not with us at the moment, but thank you. Um, and we'll move on, if we may, to um, Kerry. 
Our next speaker is Mr. Kerry Acton, who practices at the Royal Surrey County Hospital in Guildford and has recently surpassed 1,000 implantations with the evolution short stem. So, Kerry, how do you get it so right? Good luck, I think. <laughs> So I'm going to uh, take you through what I've done uh, with my 119 cases. Thank you very much for inviting me to do so. Um, there's more than one way to skin a cat, but I will show you what, what I do in my practice. Um, I will go through my three revisions briefly um, and I'll show you a near miss. So uh, beginning of May, I've done 100, uh, sorry, 1,012 and come up to 1,019. Now I came from a background uh, of uncemented stems, mostly using the old furlong and some others. The furlong has, uh, as you will know, very good results, but it was not the easiest stem to use. Uh, that's the bit I liked about it, the very good osseointegration integration uh, with the HA coating and a persistent HA coating that seems to hang around for decades. Uh, along came the furlong, same evolution, uh, same alloy, same neck geometry, same HA coating, uh, just shorter with a slightly rougher surface with some uh, plasma spray, pure titanium underneath the HA. So in selecting my patients, um, I'm a big uncemented user, but I don't use it universally. I do look at the, the patient's biological age and their life expectancy, and I do do a fair few hybrids, increasing numbers with NHS constraints these days, uh, but uncemented for fit, active patients who are likely to survive 10 or 15 years or more. Their activity demands does come into my equation. I do, as I say, use hybrid hip replacements in a lot of patients over 75, but it's really biological age that I go by. And I do do a few fully cemented hips. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that smoking can cause uh, fracture non-unions and the process of bonding of an uncemented implant uses exactly the same biochemistry as fracture healing. And I therefore will not do a cemented stem in patients who smoke. The vast majority will give up uh, having had the conversation. Uh, occasionally they don't, in which case they'll get a hybrid. I'm more confident doing an uncemented cup in a smoker than I am an uncemented stem. Uh, Non-steroidals, I'm not aware of any direct human evidence, but again, there's a lot of animal evidence that non-steroidals, which are cyclooxygenase inhibitors, uh, inhibit the, the biochemistry of fracture healing. So I also deny my patients non-steroidal analgesia for six weeks and preferably three months after their surgery. Patient size and obesity, they're not really major factors in my choice of implant. They just get a bigger incision. Bone quality is. So in the older active patient, even into their mid to late 80s, if they are very active with very good bone quality, I will still do a fully uncemented hip. And in uh, younger patients who are biologically uh, older with poor bone quality and comorbidities, I may not use a fully uncemented stem. My operative planning, I'm not a templator, I'm afraid. Um, I do look at the x-rays and think about them. I very carefully look at the leg lengths on the operating table with the patient asleep and think about what I want to achieve lengthwise at the end of the operation. I then position the patient on their side for my small posterior approach. And I use a reasonably rigid pelvic clamp to keep them in position as uh, tilting the pelvis forwards or backwards will affect cup antiversion and also the apparent leg lengths during assessment. I look at the tension of the quadriceps and the hip flexors, flexors and I then do quite a lot of interoperative measurements of uh, length of the two knees against each other compared to my preoperative findings, the tension and some uh, interoperative measurements against the resected head. Uh, this is an example of why I don't template. This is a fairly standard x-ray of a patient of mine showing fairly standard anatomy um, and a reasonably uh, moderate offset. Uh, this is another x-ray showing very different anatomy with a very large offset. Um, T plus, so the, the center of rotation is much lower compared to the greater decanter. Uh, the problem is these are the same patient with uh, x-rays taken on different days and no rotational control. Now, obviously, uh, sizing measures and rotational control will help with this, but we're still measuring off a shadow and I just prefer to do it other ways, not that I would be critical of anyone who, who does template and my trainees 
uh, when they go through the system with me will do a bit of templating. Uh, this is my on table setup with supports to keep the pelvis fairly rigid. Uh, standard prep and draping. And my incision, I'll go through these quite quickly because there's nothing special about my approach. It's just a, a small incision posterior approach. The delivery of the head. Uh, this is just a little um, dry bone illustration of how I get my, my leg lengths right most of the time. I mark the center of rotation of the head. I use a, uh, a template, which I refer to as a not very useful template, but I do still use it and guide my cut off that. I then use with the posterior approach, I can get a direct view down the femur for the femoral broaching. And I use a straight rasp, which allows me to see whether I'm in varus or not. And really the rasping is, is, is based on feel. So I am uh, impacting larger brooches until I start to meet more resistance. There's a very different feel depending on the sort of patient with a young patient with, with very hard bone, it's much more of a gradual stop and the prosthesis will rarely fill the whole uh, cavity in the proximal femur. The implant is designed to be calcar conforming, so it should be in contact with the, with the calcar on the medial side. How far it goes laterally depends on bone quality. In an older female with a softer cancellous bone, there'll be more of a sudden stop. It's important to be aware of that because you reach that stop and you will not be able to uh, sink the brooch any further. With a younger male, you can normally, with a lot of effort and risk of developing tennis elbow, uh, impact a bit further. I then look at the position of my brooch uh, and the line on the brooch in relation to my neck cut, and I try to reproduce that uh, using a trial. And I find this a very powerful tool, and another check for leg length and offset. A little view of the acetabulum after reaming. Uh, because of the small incision, uh, both in the small posterior and the direct anterior approach, special instruments are used, and this is one of the angled cup impactors I have. That's an example of the view straight down the femur, and uh, you can put any length of stem down there. I use exactly the same approach when I was doing the old long furlong. Again, my interoperative measures. In this case, I'm using a 33 degree, uh, 133 sorry, degree high offset with a 40 medium head. Uh, I use the the plastic bag that the implant comes in to avoid it touching the skin edges on the way into the patient. And that's just before reduction. These sutures here are some non-absorbable sutures in the um, short external rotators and the capsule to effect a repair at the end, like that. The dressing I use is a vapor permeable um, waterproof membrane, which goes on in theater. My closure is monocryl and glue, and that dressing stays on for two weeks. And most of the nurses within about 50 miles of where I work know that they must not touch those dressings. And I do let the patients have a shower with them on. A uh, quick example, this is one of my first evolution cases. He'd had a um, previous furlong. He was a professional stuntman, returned to work with that furlong in situ, but later wanted a matching pair and I wasn't able to give him a matching pair because I'd changed implants by then. Uh, he subsequently returned to work as a professional stuntman and he's not aware of any difference between the two, uh, but he's not seen Justin's presentation. And that's an X-ray at a year of osseointegration. If we go back between the two, you see initially the stem is sitting in the hollow bone. And what we see with the evolution is very good new bone forming around the, the lower part of the stem where load transfer is occurring. And a view from the side. Um, little top tip, various positioning is not a major problem if you're aware of it and it doesn't adversely affect your leg length and offset. And I do allow uh, a small degree of various positioning as long as it doesn't uh, cause downsizing of the prosthesis and there is stability. And this is an example with um, fairly marked various positioning, which integrated um, satisfactorily. So to date, I've had uh, just over a thousand implantations, six reoperations, two of those for late infections, uh, one sorry, two periprosthetic fractures, both of which were fixed without need for revision. There have been three cup revisions, two of which I have um, done myself, one for infection and one for an early failure with a deficient acetabulum and one revised elsewhere for dislocation. There have been no stem revisions. Very briefly show my, my failures. So this was a 
70 year old lady previous furlong on the left evolution on the right i was pretty happy with my positioning of the implants um, on the upper side of antiverted uh, but she still managed to sustain posterior dislocations um, i spoke to the surgeons elsewhere who were thinking of revising her back in 2016. She'd only dislocated twice, and it seems they didn't revise her at that point. But in 2018, I can see from the registry that she was revised. Uh, this is another patient of mine, um, left-sided uh, evolution. Um, he had no problems with that for the first uh, good few months. Uh, he developed sudden pain about six months after surgery. This was his six month post-op x-ray and you can just see that the implant has moved slightly the clinical signs of infection aspirated and e coli it's a bit of an odd one he turned out to have a pelvic abscess which um, seems to have got into the hip from the pelvis the cup was loose the stem was not and i was able to revise the the loose cup with what's supposed to be a, a temporary uh, badly cemented hip replacement but retain the stem he's now out to five years and he won't let me revise it because he's got no pain uh, and the infection is is cleared on all parameters final one was uh, uh which i take uh, most of the blame for myself this was a lady with a below uh, sorry above the amputation on the right side destroyed left hip with deficient acetabulum anteriorly it's very rare for me to use screws, uh, but there is one there. That means I was uh, um, a little bit lacking in confidence. I asked her to remain touch weight bearing for six weeks to allow that cup to us you integrate. She strictly complied with that for most of the time, but she had four steps up to her toilet and thought it would be all right to go up those with no rail and uh, no support four times a day. Um, and at seven weeks, she looked like that. Um, I revised it to the same. Uh, there were no, uh, no signs of infection, and uh, this time it worked. She complied with the non-weight bearing, and that is her one-year x-ray with integration of that side. I've subsequently revised the other side. That's all for me for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kerry. Just start my video there. Okay, so we've got a few questions for you. Um, First of all, your approach. You said uh, there's nothing special about your approach, but it's the mini posterior approach. Um, what's the best way to learn that technique? Because obviously you've got some fantastic results there with those implantations. What, what do you concentrate on to get that right? Um, I, I just started making my... I, I learned the traditional posterior approach. I'd seen a couple of people doing a smaller posterior approach. I saw people uh, trying to spare the piriformis. I did experiment with that for a while, uh, but uh, abandoned that. I just made my posterior approach gradually smaller uh, and ended up with what I've got, changed the angle gradually. And, and that, I think it's a good way of learning it because you, you can also teach it that way. Um, most of my trainees, I will start off with a, a bigger incision and they gradually they get more confident with the approach. The approach inside is exactly the same. We just make the skin incision bigger and then they can gradually uh, make the, the angle slightly different. I do it with the patients in their setup position. My incision is fairly vertical compared to the traditional posterior approach. Um, and so it can easily be learned gradually. And I think that is an advantage over some other approaches. And it is believed sometimes that short components have a high rate of um, coronal malalignment, so uh, movement into varus, when compared with a standard length stem. Um, you did talk about this ever so slightly, so it doesn't worry you. So what's your experience with stem positioning with the evolution? So it's certainly easy enough to get it into varus. Uh, it's just something you need to be aware of. And with a straight rasp, looking straight down the femur, if you're slightly in varus, you know it. And then you decide whether you're going to accept that. I mean, I always aim to get to get it straight, uh, but if there's hard bone and slight varus positioning is not going to make me undersize the prosthesis um, and is going to be stable, then I will accept it. You do occasionally uh, on the post-op film see a tiny, tiny degree of movement into varus between a, an immediate post-op and a six-week x-ray, but I've not had any cases of that progressing or being a problem. Okay. And question from Omar Sabri, um, collared or collarless? 
So I've um, done my first thousand with a collar um, because I came from the, the, the furlong background and was used to a collar. Most of the time, the collar does nothing. I view it as a safety net. And I decided quite some time ago, once I'd done my first 1,000, I'd do my next 1,000 with the collarless version because I don't think it would make any difference. Um, unfortunately, I didn't know my 1,000 had been and gone uh, before, before I'd got up to 1,020. So I'll have to, uh, have to change next week. Okay. And uh, do you find that undersizing can be a concern? You have to make sure you are straight down the femur. Um, so if you're too front to back or back to front, uh, or if you are too inverse, you, you will undersize. So it's just all about being aware of where the femur is. I will sometimes uh, step off to the side of the patient, look at my rasp handle sticking out of the patient and see that it is going roughly down the femur, obviously bearing in mind the bow of the femur and uh, taking that into account. So yes, it is potentially a problem, but as long as you're aware it's a problem and uh, know how to avoid it in practice, it's, it's not been a problem. Okay, right. Well, thank you so much. We will have to move on to the next presentation to keep on time. Um, so I'm delighted now to introduce Mr. Johan Witt, consultant orthopedic surgeon at University College Hospital in the Schoen Clinic, with a wealth of knowledge and experience in minimally invasive and young adult hip surgery. So, Johan, tell us, is learning the anterior approach worth it? All right, thank you very much, Kate, and good evening, everyone. I will just get my presentation up. <clears throat> so, um, I'll just run, uh, yeah, I'll run through a little bit about the anterior approach and uh, a bit about the, the evolution implant. Um, so, there are a number of people that have proposed a lot of advantages for the direct anterior approach, in particular that there's less soft tissue damage than other approaches, that there's a faster and easier recovery, that there's a lower risk of dislocation. So a lot, there are lots of things that have been said. Um, also there, you know, there are a number of different ways or two basic, different, basically different ways that you can do it, either using a traction table or on a standard operating table, ideally that you can extend somewhat. So there are a couple of different ways that you can do the direct anterior approach. And so in terms of the advantages, I mean, is it really less invasive than other approaches? I always quote this paper, which was done some years ago, which measured inflammatory markers and uh, creating kinase levels in two similarly matched cohorts of patients. Uh, the implant positioning was similar in both groups and they looked at the change in the creatine kinase levels which were five times higher in the it was a mini posterior group in the recovery area uh, compared to the direct anterior group and uh, nearly twice as much uh, cumulatively over the uh, full time period so i suppose you know that's a sort of reasonably objective marker uh, in terms of what sort of tissue damage might be happening during the exposure. Now, how that translates into recovery and, you know, your subsequent function, you know, that's, that's going to be much more variable and de dependent on another, a number of other factors. Um, and I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of information about the DA na now and comparing this with other approaches. And, you know, you can certainly find different papers to support the particular view that you, 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 your, which is your bias. So um, lots of uh, papers suggesting that the DAA does have a slightly quicker early recovery. Um, but I'll just go through a little bit about uh, how, how that's influenced and in the information that's available. I think what is important, however, is, you know, what the learning curve, which is definitely not straightforward. And I think this was quite a good uh, study that looked at the learning curve for uh, the DAA. Uh, they looked, this is from the Australian Joint Registry, and they looked at one implant combination via the direct anterior approach and at surgeons who had performed more than 100. And then they looked back at their operation groups uh, they're 1 to 15, they're 16 to 13, 30 and so on. And then they looked at the time to first revision. So if you look um, at the, uh, the first, the 1 to 15 operations, that their um, time to, re their, their revision rate was 6% at the follow-up period. Whereas once they'd done more than 100 operations, you can see that the revision rate had dropped very significantly. And so what this study found was that 
surgeons who had performed more than 100 procedures, uh, the revision rate reduced from 6% for their first 15 um, to 2% after they'd done 100. And then they reckoned that you need to do um, over 50 to reach a rate of re a revision rate that was no different from if you performed over 100. So I think that's a, that was quite a good way of looking at what a le learning curve for this approach is. Um, this was another study from Switzerland looking at um, <clears throat> where when they, using a traction table, uh, the Medacta stem, um, and they retrospectively analyzed their results after a minimum of five years. And the five-year survivorship rate for any implant revised was 95%, but for the first 20 cases, it was, um, <clears throat> the survivorship was 79%, so markedly lower. The um, complication rate was 8.6% and also quite a significant dislocation rate. So again, that's from a you know, good surgeon, a uh, good unit, and you could see a significant learning curve. So in terms of getting it right first time, if you're going to do the direct anterior approach, you know, you really shouldn't underestimate um, the potential issues switching from a different approach because it does feel like a very different operation. You have to make sure that you've got the right equipment available, uh, the right retractors, bespoke instruments for implant insertion, otherwise uh, things will become extremely difficult. Also import, implant choice is very Im important because obviously it's probably not going to be a good idea to change your approach and your implant because I think all of us know that you get very used to an implant, how it works, sense of stability in the bones, sizing, all those things, and if you then have changed your approach and that might have a significant impact and influence on how you assess the, the alignment and stability of your implant. And of course, it goes without sign, saying, familiarize yourself with the anatomy. Um, traction table or no traction table? Well, you know, traction tables are expensive. They're usually associated with one particular implant. Managing the position of the traction arm actually requires, you know, a separate assistant who really knows what they're doing with it because actually these are extremely powerful traction arms and all sorts of mischief can occur um, in Joel Matter's series the, the, an, an ankle fracture was included in the complication rate so just to be aware of that so we're using a regular table very comfortable uh, not implant specific I do like to be able to um, extend the uh, middle of the table so the legs can drop. I do find that easier, but it's not implant specific. Easy to assess leg lengths, easy to get the x-ray in to check, and easy to assess stability on the table. Um, you do need to familiarize yourself with the anatomy, particularly the attachment of the capsule around the trochanteric area, and the, particularly the relationship to gluteus minimus and how to get your retractor around the, the bare area, if you like, of the greater trochanter and the release you need to do to mobilize the proximal femur to get sufficient access. Uh, this, I'll just briefly run through uh, short videos. Um, so this is, you can see, the uh, TFL being retracted there. This is, I've already, I like to, to set out the capsule fairly, um, fairly clearly because I like to preserve the capsule, I don't excise any. So you can see the capsule has been exposed. Um, the head is to the right, uh, foot to the left. Um, it's a transverse skin incision, usually um, slightly oblique, 8.5 centimeters is sufficient length. And then um, we make capsular flaps. So we tag a uh, longer medial one and then a shorter lateral one and then the tractors go around the front neck and so it's been exposed and then it can be uh, takes a bit of getting used to dividing the femoral neck in this position um, I just use the neck cutting guide making an initial mark um, and uh, then we uh, in terms of the neck cut length we, uh, we, we sort of key that off the distance from the lesser trochanter so then um, we can access the uh, foot retractors to see the acetabulum sufficiently, then the offset acetabular rema, and then 
you can impact the acetabular component there you can see the transverse acetabular ligament if you like to use that to assist with your alignment this is the uh, re release that's really important to do this is the proximal femur with the bone hook and the metaphysis this is the capsular release on the inner surface of the greater trochanter that's, that's called great. there in the acetabulum so this is at, this is the key part of the operation if you don't do this then you really will struggle to uh, to actually get down the femur properly um, also it's I do that before I um, do the acetabular side simply because you get a bit more mobility of the fever femur it's easier to get it out of the way of the acetabulum for your acetabular reaming so then we expose the uh, the femur and the uh, by putting the leg in the figure four position it's good to adduct it I uh, also drop the table a little bit and uh, those that's the rasp um, rasping the proximal femur and that's with the rasp impacted and that's with the stem impacted as you can see and then uh, this is once we've uh, finished the procedure so my preference i mean there were some questions about bearing surface and so on and so forth my preference is to use ceramic on ceramic largely i, I deal with a fairly young population a lot of the time uh, head size i use as big a head as i can use depending on the cup size so with the KRI cup and the uh, uh, evolution stem um, once I'm at a 46 cup I'm using a 32 head and once I'm at a 50 cup I'm using a 36 head so those those are my standard sizes here you can see closure of the capsule afterwards um, and then the you know heels very nicely. It is nice having that transverse incision, much better than the um, the longitudinal incision, which is is not attractive. And then you can put long stems down that as well. So um, what are the indications? Well, potentially I guess any hip replacement. I think there's no doubt certain hips are less suitable than others, um, particularly if you have to use a more extensile exposure. Some revisions can be done through the DAA, but for me, that's not. I'm really not interested in that. If I want to do a, uh, a larger exposure, I would always use a posterior approach. Um, so, my personal preference uh, is the posterior approach for significant deformity, which would be uh, significant dysplasia, acetabular grafting, protrusios, femoral deformity, or any revisions. Um, but with more regular anatomy, I prefer the, to use a direct anterior approach. So is it worth switching? Well, I think it does depend what from. I think if you look at all the data that's available, it suggests that patients do benefit with less pain and a slightly faster recovery when the DA is compared with a direct lateral approach. Um, but I think um, similar studies also indicate a faster recovery with a posterior approach compared with a direct lateral. So it is harder to differentiate the difference between a DAA versus the posterior approach but there is a trend to favor the DAA in the first six weeks and I think for patients that's pretty important you know if you have your initial recovery is easier easier from the surgery I mean that's the bit that you know people can find you know find rather miserable so uh, that initial six week period I think does make a difference for patients so I think it is a safe and effective approach for THR um, I think it is minimally invasive um, preserves muscle very nicely uh, I think it is a slightly easier recovery, certainly compared to direct lateral. Um, and I think, of course, it mustn't be, uh, compromise implant position. There is definitely a significant learning curve. But obviously, if you're brought up with it, then that won't be so much an issue. So if more people are doing it, then for trainees, it wouldn't be such a bigger deal. But I think if you're going to take it up, it does require a significant commitment when you're switching from a different approach. Uh, bear in mind the lengthy... Uh, learning curve make sure you have all the kit make sure you've become familiar with the anatomy and i think you do need to be aware of certain limitations of the approach um, and you know i definitely don't use it in all cases so thanks very much happy to field any any questions i'll start sharing the screen okay thank you very much johan it's wonderful to see your technique there and excellent videos for us to see as well um so is there a point in one's career most appropriate for changing approach and considering anterior? Um, 
Um, don't know what to say really. I mean, I think it depends on your practice. I mean, if you're doing enough hip surgery, then um, you may wish to, you know, see whether a different approach allows you to uh, improve the recovery of your patients. Uh, I think it does it depend a lot on, you know, how many hip replacements you are doing as to how comfortable you might be. A lot of people will continue, obviously, with the approach that they've trained on. But I think mm -hmm. if you're doing enough hip replacement cases, you know, obviously one can make changes. Um, so personally, I you know made the change because I do a lot of anterior hip surgery with we do you know, with periastabular osteotomies and um, also you know hip arthroscopies. We always have the patient supine, so <clears throat> there are a lot of um, a lot of uh, attraction for me to to change to an anterior approach just to marry up with what I do with the rest of surgery and around the hip. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it does, it does have significant um, uh, benefits. Yeah. And do you train your registrars in the DAA approach? And, so, and yes, I mean, that's, that's what we, we do. I mean, it is a little bit more difficult for them to continue with it if they aren't obviously uh, then training with people who also do it. But um, at least they've had the exposure and then they can uh, make decisions later on in their training as to whether that's something they want to take up. Yeah. Question here from Mr. Prasad. Closure of wound in direct anterior approach. It's technically difficult to suture the piriformis back. Is that right? Uh, so we didn't routinely release the piriformis. So, um, so that's 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 not really an issue. I think okay. if you take the release a little bit further around the back, um, you know those uh, external rotator muscles are you know held very firmly together um, by you know a lot of um, you know attachments. So. You might get a little release of the piriformis, but it's not going to retract terribly far because it's actually held together with that whole cuff of muscle. So, um, but generally, you don't you don't release the piriformis. And um, what came first, your use of the direct anterior approach or your use of a short stem like evolution? Uh, so I started using the short stem with the posterior approach. Got familiar with that, and then and then started to use that through the anterior approach. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you don't use a traction table. Is that how you were trained or is that something that you've learned to do without? Um, no, so that's how the first time I saw, so I've only ever visited surgeons who don't use a traction table. And mm -hmm. it, the, so I wasn't interested in using a traction table, putting it, put it that way, because that was very much married up to one particular implant. Um, it just seemed a big palaver that was largely unnecessary. And what is the absolute best way of learning the DAA approach? So I think you have to do cadaveric workshops. Um, that's essential. And then mm -hmm. I think visitations, that's, that's, that's important. And then ultimately, how you take it forward is going to pe depend on your experience mm -hmm. and your, your volume of hip surgery, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Right, thank you. We are a little bit over time, so I'd like to move us on to the case discussion. Unfortunately, Prof Cobb is still stuck in theatre, he's yet to join us, but we do have a recording of his case presentations, which we will play now. If I could ask um, Johan and Kerry to stay on live with their videos, um, we will play Justin's presentation and then we'll have a discussion, pause it to have a discussion about the cases he's presenting, if that's okay. I'm going to just share with you um, a couple of cases. Here they are. Um, so what would Johan or Kerry do, and do you agree? First case. Um, there's no um, infection present here. There's no conservative option. We want an operation. So this 70-year-old woman slipped in the kitchen on day 10 following the surgery. She had great pain. She had to call for an ambulance. In fact, she came to hospital. Um, and here's her x-ray with a fracture running from the greater trochanter to well below the tip of the letter of the um, prosthesis. And the preoperative diagnosis is synovial chondromatosis. Otherwise healthy adult I used a 10 by 133 degree stem, 54 cut with 40 ceramic liner, medium head. Um, medium 40 head. She made excellent post-operative recovery. That was the some of your chondromatosis lesions. So what's the diagnosis and what would you do? And maybe okay, we'll so pause we there and then I'll, from my point of view, I would say it's a Vancouver B1 um, fracture. 
because even though it's only 10 days post-op, um, the prosthesis looks stable. We know this is a very benign device. And what I actually did was just use three circlage wires. Um, and she's now six months post-op. This is a Okay, I think we've paused there. Thank you, David. Um, so we can see what uh, Prof did. Um, Kerry, how would you have um, treated this patient? I'd agree it's probably a B1, but um, we don't know whether it's bonded yet or not. I've not experienced one that early. I have got one in my case is a, a later one. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, have the, the balls to do nothing and uh, restrict weight bearing and watch it. Um, I probably wouldn't have uh, been courageous enough to do that and would have done what uh, what Johan did. Sorry, what um, uh, Justin did. Um, obviously, the ultimate would be uh, plating it or revising it, but I think uh, those those wires were were almost certainly the most that was needed. Do you agree, Johan? Yeah, so I, what I was going to say, I would get a CT scan just to assess the, 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 the fracture pattern exactly and get a feel for the stability, but I, I, I would have... Hope, been hoping to do a circlage wire for that. Um, it did look very stable, and I think um, you can get away with it. Yeah, so I think that's what I would have ended up doing, having okay. reviewed the CT scan. Let's continue and have a look at the further results. And in our intervention, we kept the flexibility in our femur, and we haven't put a claw plate in, which you have to take out again. There's a very grumpy time. Um, and when, even when you take it out again, they've still got pain over the trachanta following that. She's got no pain, she's, she's very happy. And the second case um, is a progressive pain in a hip resurfacing. He was a triathlete who had this operation 2017. 2018, a year afterwards, he broke his intertrachantaric fracture, removed the metal, and in 2020, the head was collapsing into varus. Um, so you see the difference in the, head, uh, the angle here. So the head was collapsing, late segmental collapse is the diagnosis. What's the treatment uh, option? And again, a little pause for discussion here, I think. It's great staging for us. Uh, I'll go to you first, Johan. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I guess the femoral head is, um, maybe there's it's AVN or obviously there's metallosis issue that one might have to, have to rule out. But ultimately the, um, the, the, the hip resurfacings that I've revised, um, I've usually used an evolution stem. I've taken out the cup and put a large head ceramic ceramic articulation. That's my standard revision for a failed uh, hip resurfacing, I have to say. Okay. And have you experienced of the same, Kerry, uh, revising the resurfacing? I have uh, several triathletes running around with evolution, so I would have done that in the first place and uh, avoided that problem. Uh, but yes, I agree with you, Johan. Evolution is a, um, a pretty good revision stem. Uh, resurfacing revision is not demanding of the femoral side, so I would revise it with an evolution. I've got some cases in, in my collection to show in a little while of uh, slightly more adventurous e uh, evolution revisions. Okay. And I believe we've got a, another case. David, if you want to play. And actually, this is why he's now just over six months post stop, pain free. I used a dual mobility um, lining in his BHR cup. And this is the biggest furlong evolution stem we had. And it looks really undersized. Um, no cortical contact. Um, but actually, there's huge resistance to rotation in this very large device. Um, but I do think there's an issue about, about uh, sizing on x ray, at very, uh, very least. And, and, and the size range, I'd like to have an open discussion about very large people and um, certainly very big intermodalary canals. He isn't a very large person, but he has got a very big intermodalary canal. Thanks. Okay, so that will lead on to a discussion about sizing, if we may. So um, that was a size 16 there. Kerry, um, does it, do it, is the size 16 big enough? Uh, not always, but there is a size 17. I think Justin just didn't have it that day. Um, the size 17 has been just big enough in every case so far. Um, there have been a couple of cases where to get it stable, I've had to recut the neck, sink, sink the implant slightly lower and, and use a longer neck. And I've been able to do that without adversely affecting the, the offset two or three times. 
Um, so I think the 17 is is just big enough. I'm sure there's someone out there for whom it's not big enough and there's always a cemented option on the shelf in case it's not, but I've not come across that situation so far. Okay. Johan, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I mean, I must say, if, uh, if it is looking like it's going to be a really massive stem, I have actually gone back to use the traditional furlong stem, which I still think is a, is, is a really excellent stem. So... Um, question is you know whether you have a very large bit of metal in that very proximal bit of femur what will the what's the stress response just distal to that stem i'm not sure maybe it's not going to be an issue at all but certainly there'll be some cases where um, if i think i'm going to be putting a very big stem in or i'm anxious that i won't have a big enough then i'll i'll switch to the original jri which which i i still really uh, like and use quite a bit okay. yeah um, so, Johan, would you like to share with us your cases? Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll share my case. Uh, there we go. Do you want me to show some of mine while you find yeah, that, Johan? Find it again. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Gary. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll just share my screen. So I've shown you my uh, my revisions. Uh, this is a near miss. Um, this is a patient who proudly at six weeks told me she had just started reciprocating up and down the stairs and at seven weeks fell down eight of them and sustained this fracture. I wasn't going to do this just with circlage wires. Uh, when I went in, I found that the implant was uh, still bonded to one of three major parts of bone. And so I fix the fracture, sorry, let me put that on slideshow. Fix the fracture, that's an immediate post-op. And this is a, a six month post-op X-ray. The stem had, had rebonded to the, the rest of the bits of bone and uh, the patient was happy and I didn't need to remove that metal work. Uh, my cases are, are actually revisions using the, the evolution. So I've shown my revisions of evolutions. Uh, these are a few examples, this is a, a small karai, which I've been watching for several years. There was proximal lucency, which gradually spread down around the stem. It was pain-free until the end when it finally broke loose from this distal bit of fixation. And I ignored the conventional wisdom that you have to go longer than the defect. Uh, there's no real bone defect below this. So I was able to revise that quite satisfactorily with, a, with an evolution. I also revised the cup because the cup was quite malpositioned. It was, it was a, a, a little um, uh, over antiverted, let's say. That is extreme antiversion. Um, this, is, uh, this is a Kiwi um, temporary hip replacement for an infected uh, total hip replacement I removed in a fairly young patient, I think in their late 40s. So when it came to time to do the second stage, I elected to use the evolution. It allowed me to leave the distal cement in so I didn't have to fiddle around getting the last bits of cement out. Infection had been eliminated, so I was quite happy to leave that there. That's the early post-operative film. And then a, a one-year X-ray showing bonding and infilling of the space around the tip of the, the stem there. This was a, a case of infection of a native hip in a, a, a gentleman who wasn't actually chronologically terribly old. We were never quite sure why his hip became infected, but it was destroyed. I did a, a temporary hip replacement as part of the treatment of that infection, was able to successfully eliminate the infection. This was back in 2007. Uh, in that era, I used the furlong still, and I, once the infection was eliminated, reconstructed him with this. That is his tear x-ray, and the implant is clearly bonded and is stable, but there's just a little clue that it's not really bonded proximally uh, in that previously damaged bone, but it has bonded distally. That lasted for 11 and a half years, and he came back at 11 and a half years with an x-ray looking like that. Uh, it was aspirated to exclude infection. Uh, there were no biochemical or uh, microbiological markers of infection. So uh, after having a lot of fun removing that distal stem with a trephine, I reconstructed him again with an evolution, again on the basis that there was good cortical bone distal to the previous stem, 
That's his immediate post-operative X-ray. This is a six-week X-ray. Unfortunately, he didn't come back for further X-rays, but we managed to get hold of him on the phone a couple of days ago. And four years down the line, he is still going strong with that hip replacement. I think that's all of my cases. Very good. Thank you. Johan, do you have anything? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I've got one more. I oh, do apologise. This is the best one. So this is a periprosthetic fracture um, sustained in an old uncemented implant. The stem was loose. It was revised with a distally locked long HA coated stem, which never bonded. Uh, this is a, a one year X-ray. So the, the fracture had healed. There was no infection, but there was ongoing pain from a slowly subsiding uh, implant. And so I revised that in a single stage to an evolution. So that's going from a, very, very long stem to a very short stem. And I think that is a size 17. That's that really very impressive. Fun. Very impressive. Is, was that a brave thing to do? Uh, some would say it was a stupid thing to do, but it worked well. Um, it wasn't necessary to do anything more than that. It did the job. Johan, what do you think to that? No, I think, um, well, the bone had reconstituted nicely, approximately. So... Um, I think you can do that. I mean, I, I, I've used the EVO on a couple of cases, uh, cases in revisions um, where the proximal bone was good and that proximal loading is nice. Okay. But you have, to, you have to be, I think you need to be pretty, ex, you know, experienced with a stem because you kind of know what the limitations are. It's not, not something you want to just, um, you know, do, do off the bat if you haven't been using it quite a bit, I would say. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. And uh, I, mean, I, I don't have numbers, I'm afraid, for my revisions using the, the evolution, but I must have more than 20, and I've had no failures of those uh, revisions yet. Okay. Johan, are, are you able to find yes, your cases? So here we go. Here we go. Let's uh, try again here. So um, just a, a high offset dysplasia case. So this is um, someone who'd had... Um, <clears throat> A Chiari osteotomy um, and the point about this really is that um, the bone that you're going to put the hip into may, may not be where you expect and you might have to have a device that can accommodate a quite a, a large offset um, so with the pre-op planning trying to work out you know whether what sort of neck um, angle so the evolution has a 126 degree and a 133 degree and each of those angles has a, a high offset version so it's extremely um, versatile plus obviously you can vary your neck length of the head, head that you use so it's an extremely versatile implant I find that extremely helpful in these in these very I do a lot of dysplasia stuff so I, it's, it's very helpful to be able to adjust offset without changing anything else so other stems will change your length and height and that sort of thing but uh, the evolution you can switch from a 126 to a 126 high offset nothing else will change except the five millimeters of offset so with the Chiari what happens is um, the um, the acetabulum is medialized and then of course your weight bearing is the uh, the thin ileum so in fact your acetabulum is made more dysplastic because it's being adducted it's pushed in so what you have left to put say a hip replacement into is actually in a worse position in many respects than where you started. So don't be fooled by the thin, you know, the thin ileum that's sitting over the femoral head. That gives no anterior or posterior support. So if you do come uh, have these cases, it's certainly worth getting a, a CT scan. Make sure you know where the bone is. And um, also on the CT, you can make measurements as to uh, what the dimensions of your socket is likely to be because that's going to be determined by your AP diameter so if you look back at this uh, my initial uh, I was putting 58 shell here on the x-ray but that's never going to be possible with that small AP diameter so you've got to just be aware of that and so yeah what we did then was the um, the cup went uh, very medial you can see there is absolutely no bone where that ileum is there's no anterior or posterior bone that's why it can be extremely deceptive. There's actually a lot of um, bone within the muscle. There's a lot of heterotopic osculation already within the muscle. And then this is one year uh, we were able to adjust the offset to maintain the correct offset 
and the acetabulum went where that original bone was. Just be aware that it is that it is very dysplastic. So that's a, I find a very helpful aspect with the evolution stem, the the adjustment of the offset and, and length and and neck angle is a, a, a very good um, um, thing that we can we can use with the evolution. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a couple more questions here that I'd just like to um, finish up with. Um, Johan, have you had any interoperative femoral fractures and what did you do through a DAA approach? Um, so I, I've had one crack. Um, so I've done, um, I don't remember how many evolutions I've done through the DAA, probably about 400 or so, I think. Um, but I've had one crack with one surclage wire. So, you know, I think you have to be really careful. I mean, you know, with the DAA, with the transverse incision, you know, there's not much, you haven't got much of a bailout. So, um, you know, you have to be very careful in your technique. So mm -hmm. I did, was able to put a circlage wire around the, around the neck, but that's, that's the only issue I've had. It's a very mm -hmm. good stem in terms of, it's not like the blade stems, which some of the blade stems that can split your femur so easily. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a real advantage. Okay. And another question here from Mr. Sabri uh, to Kerry, actually, I'll go with first. Do you worry about large men with a high offset? Um, uh, only a little bit. The, as, as Johan said, there's quite a, a, a good range of offsets um, from, from the 133 uh, set high with a short head over to the 126 high offset with the long heads. There's a massive range to reconstruct people. Uh, it is a short stem, and the more you increase the lever arm, the more you have to consider the stability of the implant. And I guess, I don't think I've done it, but I would probably consider slowing someone down a little bit weight-bearing wise if it, it was a big man with a, um, a very large offset uh, with, a, with a 126 or 126 high offset. Uh, but otherwise, no, it's just all about stability and whether the stability achieved can uh, cope with the physiological loads. And if you think it can't, you, you reduce the physiological loads by asking the patients to slow down a bit uh, on coming off their, their walking aids. And I do do that occasionally. Uh, you know, occasionally get a little cow car crack. I'll slow the patient down a little bit um, to be cautious. Okay. Yeah, there's what there's one thing that definitely with I find with the anterior approach. I know Kerry does a very nice small posterior approach, but some people are really trying to do too much in the early stages after mm. their hip replacement, and I really discourage them from overdoing it. Um, you know, I think you just make your leg painful if you start to try and do too much in the first six weeks. So I, I really caution having a gentle, easy recovery. And then from six weeks onwards, you can really push on. In fact, um, you know, I think one of the smoothest recoveries I had was a lady who had a small periprosthetic acid tablet crack. I got her to stay on crutches for three to four weeks, no physiotherapy at all. And uh, she had the least amount of pain during her recovery and at six weeks, effortless range of motion. <laughs> and so I definitely, encourage that that approach rather than trying to do 10,000 steps within two weeks. Mm. Okay, right, we are a little over, but I see that we haven't lost uh, many attendees. Um, I will just uh, close now and move back to the polling, um, if I may. So, um, David, if you could post the last two questions for the attendees to answer. Um, so that's how likely are you to use a short hip stem in the future? So it's the same question as before. Um, already using a short stem, likely, not sure, or not likely. And we can, we'll see if we can see any uh, difference there. So one answer, how likely are you to use a short hip stem in the future? Okay, David, if you could just reveal those answers. Right, 57% saying likely, which I believe has gone up since before the start. We played the presentations and had the case discussions. So uh, that's very good work. And nobody's saying not likely. I think we have one last polling question. Are you likely to want to find out more about using a short stem after the webinar? So already using likely or not likely. We won't spend too much time on this. If we could reveal the answers there. 86%, uh, okay, it's very good. 
So thank you so much so there, there, to our... Uh, just a couple of questions on the Q&A. Can I quickly address? Yeah. So there's one yes, of course. someone who's very concerned that we're saying you should be careful using a stem. So look, I hope you're careful using any stem. And the issue is that you know, you're putting a stem in with careful rasping technique. You're making sure that you're getting seated, seated correctly. So we're just advising caution, and particularly if you start to use a new stem. So, you know, I, I would hope that you're using due care with any stem. But um, the evolution stem is, you know, it's just like anything. You have to get used to how to use it. And then any limitations to with short stem arthroplasty as in high impact activity? Absolutely not. You know, once the implant is bonded, um, you know, it's the coating on the JRI stem is an exceptionally high quality coating. And you see fantastic um, bone remodeling around the implant, you know, we all, we've all seen Karai stems delaminate and get loose. You do not see that with a JRI coating. Um, once it's bonded, it is bonded. It doesn't debond. And no. I absolutely encourage patients to do impact exercise. I think maintaining your bone strength in the future is essential, and you do that through impact exercise. So I absolutely encourage that. Kerry, do you have any? No, I'd, I'd second that. I have several triathletes, marathon runners. Um, you know, they're my test beds. One of my evolutions came second in the World Duathlon Championships a few years ago, um, and he, he's he's been tracking his his exercise with a Fitbit type device since before his um, his hip replacement. We're going to analyse that at some stage. But there are a few individuals doing crazy amounts, and uh, nothing's gone wrong so far. Eight years in. Excellent. Thanks. So I think we'll take that advice. I'm going now to do some high impact sports <laughs> to preserve my bones for future. Um, thank you so much, um, Kerry. Thank you so much, Johan, and also to Prof Cobb um, for sharing your philosophies, knowledge and experiences this evening. It's been a real pleasure to host. So thank you. And also thank you to our live attendees. I hope you've enjoyed the session as much as I have. Please do get in touch if we can provide you with further education and practical support in getting started in using a short stem. You can visit our website, for further information, optics and links to past and future webinars. And if you follow us on LinkedIn, you will see our future dates for more learning activities. And just a reminder to fill in your evaluation forms so that you can receive your CPD points and so that we can get feedback so that we can improve the future. Okay. So good evening and thanks. Yeah, goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Kate. Thank you.